Okay, so I talked to a lot of my friends. I said, Bugsy's coming on. And of course, uh, up here, I think a lot of guys were excited. Everybody's like, oh, geez, Bugsy's coming on. No way. But the biggest thing I wanted to start with is in your Instagram bio, everybody love everybody. I think I think Semi Pro is one of my favorite movies of all time. And the fact that you're quoting Jackie Moon, it's just, I was like, this is going to be perfect. I mean, I got to ask, like, what's that all about? Is that just straight your personality? Is that your mantra? Yeah, I think uh, it's definitely a personality and just the world today, like uh, hopping on this podcast is a no brainer. I think um, uh, you doing this and, you know, just just talking about healing and different ways to, to help people, uh, especially throughout the hockey community. I mean, more people need to realize that we're all in this together and uh, yeah, everybody love everybody. And it, it should uh, turn out OK if we're all, you know, trying trying to, to help each other out instead of uh you know put each other down 100%. no i we, we were talking before you came on and like i said to you like smitty was like do you know bugsy and i was like no but i saw his instagram handle at ele in it and i was like we got we gotta have him on because it's exactly what we're trying to do here and you said it like sometimes it's difficult in the hockey world to like open up and to kind of lean on other people and stuff so I mean, we're, we're pumped to pumped to have you on, I guess we'll just throw it back here to start, just talk about like your upbringing in, in Pittsburgh. And, um, I, I read on Wikipedia first Pittsburgh born and trained player. So w- what does that mean? Does that just mean, cause you came up playing minor hockey there and then ended up playing for the pens? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there wasn't. Um, and I mean, technically uh, myself, uh, RJ Umberger and Jason Crane, we all kind of got drafted in 99. Um, and then I think we were kind of more of the local uh, kids that were kind of raised there, played for the Pittsburgh Hornets and then kind of moved on uh, to college. Uh, but we, yeah, we were kind of more locally uh, raised through the associations there. Um, originally, I, I, w- I seen Pittsburgh before uh, the Lemieux era, uh, when my dad played there. Um, so I was very fortunate to grow up in this hockey world as a young kid and, and see it grow, uh, especially in Pittsburgh, where you went from having three rinks to hundreds of rinks now and elite programs and a division one school at Robert Morris university that a men's and women's team. Um, and hopefully it still continued to grow into a hockey town, but, yeah, I was fortunate to kind of be in the walls of the rink. Uh, my dad, uh, for people that don't know, played uh, 12 years in the NHL. Um, he started in Pittsburgh. Um, when he was done with his career, he uh, went back to Pittsburgh and got a job uh, through uh, Herb Brooks and Ken Schinkel, helped him get a kind of a scouting job. And then he ended up becoming the head scout there. Uh, so his office was kind of next to Craig Patrick's office in the in the, in the civic arena back in the day. So my bro- brother and I used to go around and uh, play hide and go seek with our roller blades, skate around the civic arena. I kind of grew up in that, uh, in that rink, but really got to see things from behind the scenes. Um, and my dad ended up drafting guys from Yager all the way up to Crosby and Flurry. And uh, it was pretty crazy to look back uh, at uh, how long he's been a part of that uh, organization. And um so I grew up in this hockey world and I was very fortunate to uh, put on the, the black and gold. And it's, it's crazy to, to talk about even now, uh, Steve Latin was a, a trainer for the Penguins and used to sharpen my skates as a, just a little kid. And used to even give me like recce sticks or Yager sticks when they kind of first came in. And um, then my first day of training camp, uh, you know, I'm putting on the sweater for real and he sharpened my skates and that's, I was always little Bugsy around the rink and then I uh, became Bugsy uh, uh, once I made the team there and stuff. But uh, yeah, it, it was awesome. a crazy world one. And now even for this three ice league um, that Eddie Johnson's son kind of started, Craig Patrick's the commissioner and Stevie, Stevie Latin's the trainer uh, for this three <laughs> ice thing. So he, he's helped me out, but uh, he had my kids uh, running around there in Denver helping out down underneath. So it was pretty cool to, to see this hockey community, hockey family, uh, as you guys know, it's a, it's a small, small community and we can do a lot of good for each other. So uh, I was very blessed to, to grow up that way and be around those amazing people. 
So that's why I think I read somewhere just one of your free agents. I think maybe when you left Pittsburgh or I could be wrong, but you had some sort of thing saying you, you didn't want to go to Philadelphia just because of that Pittsburgh interstate rivalry. So now it all makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally from two years old, I had a, a penguin sweater on just like you, you hear so many other hockey families uh, that get to grow up like that. Uh, and I got to live out my childhood dream. So it was, uh, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because I was chatting with uh, like Colby Amell and um, obviously now their their oldest cruiser is fully invested into, you know, lacrosse and hockey. But Riley and I were talking before and I mean, it's usually been your, you know, Minnesota's, your Michigan's, your like all those for, I guess, the hubs of the the hockey world. But I mean, Mel was saying now like it is it is cutthroat in Pittsburgh. Like it is like you are in for it, especially in like that age of hockey, which is good. I mean, I'm glad that obviously Pittsburgh is getting on the map. Um, I wanted to direct it to just like your draft day. And like, I mean, being able to, to know that, you know, Pittsburgh is going to be home. Um, And I mean, growing up, having your dad in your, like in your corner and having all these guys that you grew up with, all these names that you just mentioned. I mean, how, I, I, can you even describe how that was? <laughs> um, it, it was at first, you're almost hoping you don't get drafted by Pittsburgh because of just the daddy thing, you know? Um, and the pick right before us was the San Jose sharks. Um, and I spent a lot of time up uh, in Minnesota, Minnesota hockey camps, um, that, uh, Chuck Rillo, Herb Brooks, JP Parisi, um, and, uh, Mr. Hendrickson kind of put together, and it was kind of like this boot camp for hockey players. Um, those guys were like in the seals and stuff. So they did some crazy <laughs> training stuff back in the day, but it was like, you know, you're getting four or five workouts a day. Um, it's kind of like a boot camp, but uh, I-, I loved every, every second of it. But for, for the draft, um, I knew from my dad and I guess experiences before that, even though you get drafted, it, it doesn't really mean anything. You know, a lot of people pump it up, but he's like, there's look at all these first rounders that never get a sniff or you don't really hear about again. So I knew I still had a lot of work left. Um, so it was an honor to get drafted. And I know my dad at the time kind of said he would always leave the room uh, when there was the team meetings kind of about me and where they wanted to position me and stuff. So Herb Brooks kind of took the reins in that department. And uh, on that day, uh, Herbie ended up, uh, they decided to pick me in the fourth round there. And I walked down to, uh, the table in Boston and that's everyone I grew up with. And, uh, it was pretty amazing. You know, it was, it gives me goosebumps, uh, thinking about it, you know, you never thought, uh, it was a reality, but I also knew there was still a lot of hard work and it probably wasn't until I was a junior in college, um, when I was at St. Cloud state and I saw some of my buddies, uh, Mark Hardy and Doobie Westcott, uh, you know, play some NHL games after like the college season, you know, so you're, you're, they're playing with you and then you see them on TV in the NHL game, like, oh, okay, well maybe I can play in the NHL. <laughs> so that was kind of my like, oh, okay, uh, moment where maybe there's a chance. So uh, yeah, that was uh, kind of reliving the draft. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to get drafted by Pittsburgh. So you hit on a bit, like, I think, well, we, we had Jordan Everly on right before this and he said the same thing, like you get drafted and it's just a stepping stone and it's obviously a big deal, but there's still a lot of work to be done and we don't have to hit on every developmental stage after, after the dra- draft. But like when you look back on it, you had an amazing rookie year in, with Pittsburgh. Like what sticks out to you about making that transition, transition smooth or maybe someone in particular that you leaned on or whatever it may be? Yeah, we... I mean, that first year going in, I just remember leaving college. I'm like, I get to say hockey's my job now, even if I was in the American League. You know, I didn't even care where I really ended up. So I'm like, I get to just play hockey for my job, um, which I thought was so cool. You know, it didn't really matter how much um, you just get to, you got to call hockey your job. I think coming from Pittsburgh, as we mentioned, there was never those local kids before that even went to Division One college. So you didn't know what level you could really reach. You know, I had a few friends went like junior B or Culver military school. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Cause you didn't really know in Pittsburgh where you could go. Um, so that, that kind of helped, I guess, uh, 
with the mindset of, you know, trying to um, enjoy every moment. I mean, that rookie year we finished last, but I know for sure I, I couldn't ask for a better year. I traded him for the Stanley Cup, yeah. but I finished 30th again. Uh, yeah. Just with, uh, being with uh, some of the older guys on the team, Mario came back that year. Kelly Buckberger was my roommate. That's back in the room. That had to have been crazy. Like guys you watched as a kid when you're like idolizing and then you get to play with some of them. Like, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Even uh, Yager was, it was funny because uh, I think it was with the Rangers or something. My first year, maybe it was even Washington. He's like, oh, fuck, little Bugsy. He was like, real life. <laughs> Even Ron Francis was still playing then too. Um, and uh, I met Ron Francis. He was my favorite player growing up. So my dad played in Hartford. And I think he threw my brother into the stinky laundry, like after <laughs> practice. So I always remember that as a kid, like him and Kevin Deneen and all that fun stuff in the locker room, you know, we got to experience and stuff, but uh, um, it, it was pretty cool. And then obviously like, I think most guys we, we talked to Colby Armstrong and, and abs and like, was there one instrumental person that really took you under their wing when you made that jump? Or was it just a case of, I mean, this has literally been my home for the past however many years. I kind of have that foundation. Now I just got to figure it out for myself. Or do you look back and be like, I wouldn't have really got where I was without that individual or a couple individuals? Yeah, I think all the older guys uh, played a role, you know, and I think, you know, especially back then it was, you know, my very fortunate that my dad play. So you know, you really look at all his advice and, and it was never based on points or even as a young kid, oh, how'd you play? And he'd always ask me, oh, how'd you think you played? And I, oh, pretty good. Oh, and he just, cause he just wanted you to have fun and fall in love with it. So, you know, I think that's where I got lucky. My dad understand how hard it is to make it and just ultimately have fun. So I fell in love with the game and realized I'll, it didn't matter where I was going in the world. I just loved hockey. And um, so my dad obviously was a big uh, part of it, but I think then that rookie year, just listening to the veterans, how they prepare for games, the long season, like stuff you're, you're not familiar with as a kid, um, you know, tasting red wine and sushi. <laughs> All those, uh, things you don't experience in college when you don't have any money. You know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, life experiences, I think all the older guys you lean on, uh, and kind of to, to find your own way. So you, you kind of see how things work, but ultimately, you know, you keep your mouth shut and your ears and eyes open, right? <laughs> we, we took Matty Veneers as our like first round pick. Like he's going to be, uh, he's was sick for us this year. Only played 10 games, but we took him, Ty, we were in Calgary. We took him to that River City Park or whatever, River like cafe right, or whatever. River Cafe. Yeah. And it's like farm to table, like really like small, delicate portions and like, wild boar and all this like these crazy meats and stuff he's like what, where the fuck am i <laughs> like take me to red lobster <laughs> like, so it's pretty funny but it is so cool seeing those guys when they're so raw but like it also like to your point and you can speak on this like the importance of that veteran leadership and like having those guys in the room that can like calm the group down or like get them going or whatever it is i feel like it's kind of falling out a bit of like that and the importance of that you see it with the teams that win and even like Colorado like bringing in some some older players that play on like third or fourth line and um I don't know it's just like I look at the way you guys were and then when Sid came in too like he had all those guys to lean on and they've kind of maintained the importance of that too and obviously they've had so much success so I don't maybe just talk on a little bit of that importance yeah, I think ultimately um, the veterans there, we had Mario and uh, his boy, Mark Bergevin was kind of in his final year. So he was keeping the room light all, all the time. Uh, and I think ultimately you realize you have to remember, we're just playing a game, you know, yeah. like you feel for the guys in Toronto that get picked over, you know, every little thing. It's like, it, it is a hockey game. The puck might bounce funny one night, right? Like it's just one night. Like we have 82 more games left or whatever. So, I mean, yeah. like it, just the, the scrutiny, I feel like the players get, sometimes they add all this extra pressure on when the, then you have a veteran come in there and kind of calm things down um, and understand, just put in maybe the, the big picture of things. Um, 
you know, how, just how to carry yourself and, and not really add any additional pressure or stress. And the, usually when you're out there enjoying yourself, having fun and being in the moment as you can be, I mean, you're going to play your best hockey, you know? So yeah. I think um, that just is re reassuring to hear, especially guys, if you got guys playing over a thousand games in the league, there's a there's a recipe uh for that you know it's, uh, but um you know and i think young guys that want to have a long career you, you, you need to come in with the attitude of you, you don't know anything of hockey yeah. right it's crazier the higher level you go it actually becomes the more simple the game really breaks down to be and it's cool playing those championship games or olympics because it's like a chess match almost with the systems and uh, just comes down to these little things, which is, uh, you know, you try to stress her to the younger generations and sometimes it gets lost, you know, yeah. but uh, ultimately it's, it's great to have that experience in the room for I think guys to lean on and then to, to grow together. And um, you only grow from, you know, those experiences, good or bad. Yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. saw the thing with uh, Eric Johnson. He was saying how Cognano did that speech before game six and had guys in tears. I think that's, uh, I mean, it's refreshing to see because Riles was saying, I mean, it's, it's not getting lost by any means, but I definitely, I think even I understand that, I mean, when you guys came into the league, like having guys like you did on your teams, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. Um, I have one more question because I definitely want to dive in. I think we align on a lot of things, Bugsy. I think you're a glue guy as well. Um, I was the same way. Uh, I want to touch on a lot of that, but um, this is one of Army's things. You go, I'll read it quote for quote, um, ask him about what clicked in him to become a scoring big man with silky hands to this feared power forward with that presence. I mean, talk about, I guess, your versatility in that realm. Like, was it a case of, was that something in you that clicked where it's like, okay, I got to switch up just a couple things because I mean, I can't do exactly what I did at St. Cloud State or was it just a case of, you know, this is what I got to do. Yeah, I think um, early on, as I mentioned, that Minnesota hockey camps uh, with Chuck Carrillo there, you know, it talks about character, talks about having different tools in your toolbox to have a long career. If, you know, you want to play hockey and you're going to realize, you know, on some teams you might be a goal scorer, but to be on a, maybe a championship team, you might be a checker. So you better have some, you know, be hard nosed, be hard to play against some, some other tools. So I think those first few years, yeah, I was, a uh, little bit more um, not a perimeter player but I didn't really feel like I had to fight as much or anything I was just trying to you know score goals and have fun and then we got Sid and everyone and then I was I lost my uh, half wall position to like Mario I think <laughs> I'm like oh shit where am I where am I gonna even play and uh, I'm like um, I better go learn learn to fight yeah um, my dad had a long career um, and his brother actually was a first round pick, uh, Jim Malone to the Rangers. And he was more of a, a tough guy. Um, and our grandpa's name was wild Bill Malone. Um, so we did have the, the mean streak in us, but my dad's like, Oh, just show up those first few years. And I would just take some beatings. And I was like, dad, I don't think I'm really helping the team. So I had to like go <laughs> learn to fight. And, uh, yeah, I think that helped. Uh, kind of round out my game or find a place uh, on the team there um, where I could uh, stick up for some teammates as well as, you know, put the puck in it. I think just from playing roller hockey as a kid and always stick out in the garage um, just as a kid, you know, um, will help with the hands part. So um, you had any, any, uh, any like combatant that sticks out in your head that maybe you shouldn't have been going against when you were young? Uh, I remember my first train, the first training camp was like, uh, I think it was my third game in three nights. And just, you're like, yeah, it was my first time ever playing three games in three nights. Like God bless the, the jungle because no one <laughs> understands how hard that is. But I'm like thinking in my head, like I have no juice. How can I even make the team or do something else? Right. Just get your name on a score sheet. So I think Steve McKenna was our tough guy at the time. He was like six, eight, uh, big guy. And I was like, uh, Jody Shelley or that Jean-Luc Grandpierre oh, uh, on the exhibition game. He goes, jean Grand Luke, like he's, thank God he threw me away from Jody Shelley. Yeah. Um, I was willing to like fight the biggest guy and take a beating just to show uh, I was a willing combatant uh, at least. So and then if I lost, I felt like I, you know, I did, I had an excuse. So he was bigger than me if I, yeah. I did lose. 
Those three on uh, those three and threes are are crazy too because a lot of the times I felt like when I played in the AHL, like the third game was when all the the tough guys just were willing to do something stupid just to get them off the ice. Like they didn't want to play anymore, so they were like, <laughs> we had a few a few like not crazy but guys that were just like you didn't mess with. And then our third game in three days always ended up just being a shit show. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 crazy, and then it's it's funny because then you hear like you kind of see like the pro scouting side of things, like they go watch that third game and like judge a player by like, oh, he wasn't good on Sunday as well. Just, <laughs> yeah, you know, fighting yeah. for his <laughs> life, playing out. So like, did they take that into consideration at all? Because I, you know, my dad they had like a system of how to like rank players and stuff. So I got it was kind of interesting to see both sides of that, you know. So, yeah. but, uh, um, crazy. so we're going to, this is going to, this might bring up some bad memories for you, but I think it's just like a good way to open up and talk about like just the recovery of like coming back from such a hard loss. So in 2008, obviously you guys lose in the finals and then you end up signing the contract the next year to go to Tampa Bay. But obviously like the winning team gets all this attention and everything, and you don't ever see what goes through the player's head of, of in the, of being the on the losing end, so I did read too that you took some bad shots in that that final series and um, breaking your nose, and I think you got hit by Hal Gill's slap shot or something. Correct me if I'm wrong, but like just like that traumatic loss, and then you go into the summer, your body's hurting, you have all these bumps and bruises, and then you got to get ready for the next season. Like, talk about what that was like. Um, the grind not only physically but but mentally too yeah I mean mentally I mean I was in those stands as a 13 year old uh, you know with my brother 14 when the, the Penguins were winning the cups uh, in the early 90s so we had like the little Jaws poster over our head like when the power play came out and, and the Hey song was going on so then to put on the sweater and now have a chance to bring a Stanley cup to the city uh, was beyond, you know, I'm still living this dream. I'm playing for this, for the Penguins. And now the first year in, in Ottawa, I remember it was like, Oh, the playoffs are different. So the first year we got swept, I think in five games and it felt like they had 10 guys on the ice because they were just like shooting pucks for everywhere, chipping it in very, you know, simple hockey. Um, and we we're like, we we're just, our heads were on a swivel those first few games. But um, then that following year, yeah, we got in um, in 08. And I remember they gave me the microphone, I think, before the playoffs started. And I was like, for, in front of the, the Civic Arena, I was like, all right, well, let's, we're in the playoffs. Let's try to win this thing. And I mean, I, I can't explain how, I mean, you just are willing to give it all, you know, to, to win that thing. So you just go lay it on the line. And I mean, it was finishing every check hard, whatever it may be. And I just remember with the knees and ice bags, when the playoffs were over, it was like, I mean, I felt awful for uh, so many weeks. I mean, I, I still feel awful, but <laughs> it started in May, and I was like, oh my gosh, imagine like going like Tampa the last few years, like you're watching them get to the finals year after year after year. It's like, I can't imagine, uh, what that feels like so that that one year um yeah I, I, we came up short and um i think at the moment uh hosa it sounded like was going to sign with pittsburgh and all these things so they ended up trading our rights to tampa and i was like florida sounds pretty good uh, after after the playoffs along with having uh, you know Vinny and then stammer was uh, their draft pick. So I'm like, there's some centers I could uh, go go help yeah. out. And uh, also just, I was like, I don't want to go play in like the, the Battle of Alberta after the playoffs. <laughs> you know, I was like, because <laughs> my, my body was just like, everything was, uh, it just did not feel good. And I don't know if I was ever really diagnosed with a concussion, but I definitely yeah. got all rung a few times and uh, was hurting after that. So, but uh it's, it's all worth it. You know, that's the scary part. We'd all uh, go lay it all on the line again to try to get our name on the trophy. And that's just a, a childhood dream. I, I mean, I wear all my scars and injuries uh, proudly. So um, yeah. it just comes with the territory. 
And you say it perfectly, um, laying it all out there. I think obviously physically it gets shown blocking shots, doing your part, you know, finishing checks. Um, but mentally, I think like I touched on being the glue guy, I mean, you grew up watching all these idols and then you come in, you play with Crosby, Malkin, Stammer, Vinny, you know, Marty St. Louis. I mean, just to you, um, I, I probably went through the, I went through something where it was just like, you know, being the glue guy is tough. You know, you don't get as much recognition. You're exhausted sometimes, you know, but for you, like how valuable was it looking back to know that, you know, you gave it all on the ice, but also off the ice. Like, was it ever a case of you got exhausted and you're like, I, I'm, I need a little break from being the glue guy. Or is it a case of, I just want to do whatever I can for the team on and off the ice. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I think it was all about, when I think of glue guy, I think of also like you're connecting the, the all-stars on the team with, uh, with the, with the grinders, uh, the enforcers, whatever it may be. Um, and I, I don't, to me, we're all obviously on the same team. I always looked at everyone equally and I never, ever felt uh, stressed out or anything by trying to help the team. I think one year I tried to shoot for my dad's record of goals. Um, he had 35 one year. Uh, my brother was like, try, you know, but, but other than that, I'd never really cared about my points or anything. It was about getting to the playoffs. I was very fortunate to be on some long-term deals. So it was, it was always about the team uh, moving forward. And um, I, I enjoyed every second of it. You know, I, it was, uh, it was one of the best jobs in the world. So, <laughs> which actually kind of leads me into uh, what, what I'm kind of doing now. We're excited to, um, I'm hopping on with the alumni, hopping on the board there um, and really starting to, I think we're going to get digitalized and have a place where all the alumni can get together and help each other out. So it's, uh, it's been a long time coming. So I'm excited for, for what's to come for, for all of us. Yeah. We chatted with Q actually. And I mean, um, I think with Q as well, you know, losing that team aspect after the game um, was hard for him. But now, I mean, he's fortunate enough to work with a, a group in Colorado, the Colorado Warriors, and he's fortunate enough to, you know, be a big, big piece of the alumni as well. Was that the same case for you? I mean, like we said, I mean, you did everything you possibly could. And I, I think I can't I, I don't want to assume this, but I would assume that the dressing room was kind of your home as well. Um, and it was for me. And so losing that after your career was it a case of for those first couple of years it was incredibly challenging to you know get that back or want that feeling back or was it now you know being able to do what you do post-career you're like ah you know I found it I found it again and I'm happy yeah I mean it's definitely hard and at first you don't really think about it because just even as a young kid you get all the older guys coming back oh make sure you line up something for when you're done this is only in the first chapter and you're like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're already on, you know, like, you're so fo- I mean, you're just so focused and you're like, you reach your dreams. So you're like, I'm not even worried about anything else. I'm, this is like my, this is my everything. So you're not, I could have used some of that smarts, you know, probably that I have now when I was a little younger, but um, yeah, I think the transition, you, you hear any athlete from any sport, it's, it's all the same thing. It's that camaraderie. It's having the goal greater than yourself uh, and being part of a team. Um, and I think as, as a hockey players, I mean, our happy place is the hockey rink. We can go out there by ourselves and s- snipe a few you know, pucks around and just hear the blades on the ice and put a smile on our face. Um, and I think now that all of us are, I think, realizing and understanding the power of our you know, platforms, no matter how small it is, we put them all together we can shine a lot of light on a lot of positive things that are happening in communities. And, you know, that, that's, you want to affect people. We got to get into the communities and we already have guys there. So it's like, now we just need to kind of network the information better and flow some funds to, to these communities to really make a, a positive impact, which I'm, I have no doubt the hockey community can do together. Um, yeah. And that's what's fired me up recently I think when you retire, I did the stay at home dad thing. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna retire, just do that. And then, you know, you're just you're in, in the kids line at school. You're like the only dad on all the field trips. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I talked to a few other like baseball guys and they're like, we, they did it for a little bit. And then it's like, well, you can't just stay at home all the time. Um, 
So actually, I went out and volunteered at, uh, in Minnesota at a fire department, went to fire school because it, it was a volunteer job and it was flexible. And it's just that camaraderie again, right? Having a, a beer after training um, and you get to help someone on their worst day. And I thought those were, uh, it was awesome to just do that uh, as well. And that's where I kind of found that purpose. And now I think with this Web3 and NFTs, I mean, I can look, think back to 94 when the NHL got locked out and then we got locked out in 04. Players have been, you know, dying for a, a way to generate another revenue stream um, from their careers. And, uh, you know, the time I think is coming. So that's exciting for, for athletes everywhere. And I know uh, Torch Pro as well is it's about the athletes, you know, and that's where um, the power is. And that's where we can make a lot of uh change a positive change yeah i like what you said too about like the alumni getting into the alumni group because like even if you guys push the current players to do some of these things that can connect them with the public or in a positive way with the communities but then also like open it can open up doors for them too right like and it's so hard you know how it is like to focus on something else while you're playing like you're just so solely driven and if you're not, then you could be like losing out a bit. But I think when you have like older guys like yourself telling some guys while they're playing, like, it's okay. Like you can do this. Like it will help you. Like, because I think for so long, there was like this negative um, reputation that if you did anything for yourself, because hockey is such a team first game. So I think like, what you do is, and especially how powerful Pittsburgh, just specifically Pittsburgh's alumni group is like, if you can just give these guys a little kick in the ass, be like, Hey, it might not be a bad thing to show your face in the community a little more. I think it could make hockey even that much stronger. So I think that's cool. But what's the NFT thing about? I seen your, I saw your, your Instagram. What's the, what's all that about? Yeah. There's like the, the, the beauty bunch NFTs. It's just, it's really, I mean, everyone gets caught up in the artwork and things, you know, um, and there's uh, NFTs with uh, fantasy sports as well. Another uh, platform um, that I've kind of grew up with here that are, we're just kind of getting going, but it's about, you know, really just having a digital ticket to be part of the community. So then they can, um, you know, offer special experiences um, and special uh, deals through different partners and brands that are amongst the community. I mean, all it really is doing is putting the hockey community together digitally to yeah. have people, whatever they may want to access, to grow together, which is, um, you know, I think pretty cool. You know, it's kind yeah. of just a way to tie us all together. And um, ultimately, like I've mentioned before, you're kind of hopefully shining light on some of these different programs or helping uh, people in different communities um, with whatever it may be. Um, you know, I think um, we're September 24th, we're wa launching like the Malone Family Foundation. And it's, uh, we're going to help, we're supporting uh, the Pittsburgh Warriors, which is Hockey is Healing. Um, we have like 22 service members, uh, men or women commit suicide a day. So they use hockey in that locker room as kind of that outlet and kind of get uh, guys together. Um, so they have that camaraderie. There's guys that have never skated before to guys that have played hockey growing up. And it's just about that, the locker room, right? Yeah. And people to talk to that have been in your shoes. Um, so we're, uh, doing a, a we're launching, uh, the Malone family foundation. And then we're kind of partnering up with the Pittsburgh Warriors for this roller hockey tournament. Um, awesome. yeah, that'll be pretty exciting. We're happy to, to help out. There's, um, I think you look at hockey, hockey changes lives as a slogan for the Hendrickson Foundation in, in Minnesota. And they have the largest uh, um, tournament in North America with sled hockey and disabled vets. Um, it's, it's incredible um, what they've done. And that's kind of a grassroots um, foundation that started uh, a few years ago and has really taken off. But ultimately, as we say, that's the beauty of thing of hockey. Like even if you don't have legs, you can put go on a sled and still get out there and feel the cold breeze or whack the puck around. Um, and hockey is one of those sports where you, you can really have everyone take part. They even have uh, blind hockey, 
with a beeping puck. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I was like, Whoa. <laughs> Maybe I should go play in that league now. You know, <laughs> but uh, it is, it, and, and uh, Larry Hendrickson, um, their two boys, Darby and Danny. Uh, started it when Larry uh, passed away, but he was a, a hockey guy there in Minnesota, and everyone said I never met him. Um, but after games, he, he never cared what the score was, even to the other team. It was all about the values hockey brings uh, to the community to make that person feel part of the team and respected. You know, every time they walk in the locker room, and I think yeah. that's uh, what you guys are spreading the word about. And I couldn't be happier to be on here and continue to spread the love. In, in the for the game i love it bugsy um so september 24th i might have to schedule my next pittsburgh trip i'll uh, i'll let colby and mel know that we're coming down um but also yeah. sledge hockey is the most humbling sport in the entire world i went out <laughs> with my boy Straz, who we brought on a couple weeks or i guess a couple months ago now and wow like i i mean i, I would by no means was i like a phenomenal hockey player but like when i when you like it's so hard <laughs> oh, yeah yeah and it's hard. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you cut, you touched on it and like, you know, spreading the love. And um, one of your uh, Instagram posts was with your son and it says, you know, love the game and it will love you back. Um, I think we all have experienced how special the hockey community is at some point in our lives. We experienced it and I, I still can't even put into words. I mean, how truly special the hockey community is. I wanted to touch on, you know, you didn't directly play with some of the guys that have been outspoken lately, you know, your Carey Prices and your Jonathan Druans. But when you see that, you know, when you see a guy that you grew up playing against and you grew up or not grew up, but in the National Hockey League playing against all the time. And when you see a guy having to take a step back and having to take a step back for himself, how does that make you feel? I think it's great, right? It's a, I think it's a sign of really maturity and understanding yourself and not letting those outside pressures change you ultimately, right? It's about really believing in yourself and whatever may, that may be and uh, doing what's best for yourself. So yeah, I think it's great. I think it's, it's great for people to know that other people are mentally every day going through a battle and then you know, I, I like how everyone's touching base, but if we can also look at things that are healing people, start talking mm -hmm. about, like, everyone's kind of scared to talk about real food. You know, it's yeah. like, if you have kids and, you know, if they're acting up and stuff a lot. I mean, in the hockey community too, I was fortunate to travel to Europe and these places and you realize, oh, the M&Ms have different ingredients than <laughs> the M&Ms in the States, right? Like, yeah. what the hell why is one band here and then you know so it's just like these little things i think sometimes athletes are maybe more knowledgeable than sometimes the general public where you don't have these experiences to see it but it's like these these things i, I feel i really feel like sometimes the kids get lost um in some of those things where you have these parents that are willing to do whatever drive their kids five hours to go to the rink sometimes it'd be on the the a team even though johnny might be the 14th forward <laughs> You know, it might be better to play down and just drive an hour around where he's the best player yeah. and, and to get him good food, too. If he's always walking in with McDonald's or, or something, you know, I, I, to me, that's it, just because you, you know what it's doing to people uh, ultimately, you know, and you, you understand tough circumstances and people can eat whatever they, they can get. But also, if you have the choice, it's like these little things, um, yeah. you know, as well. It's like the exercise part of it too, like food and exercise, like two, like such simple things that just yeah. are, you, you're never going to get like a news source writing. Oh, like exercise is good for depression. Like it's just because it's boring, but like, it's so true that it, that it helps so much. So uh, I, I totally, I totally agree with you though. Like we talked, I remember Nick Tyler, Nick Hardwick, he was a center for San Diego Chargers for a while. We had him on here and he said, um, like, it's great that people are taking the time to worry about themselves, but we also got to seek to go in a direction where we don't have to do that anymore because we don't feel, or we have the tools in place to deal with the pressure. And we know how, when it's coming and that we know when we're feeling like shit that we can maybe have some tools to navigate through it. So it's tough, but like, speaking of exercise, I wanted to ask you about the Brazilian jujitsu stuff. What's, what's yeah. going on with that? 
that that will kick your butt first of all that um that started with my boys uh we were in minnesota and it was kind of like to get them active and moving around and i was like man i, I wish my dad told me about jiu-jitsu when i was back when i was 15 um just for a workout but ultimately um you're, you're learning self-defense and it's it's a great workout so we started as a father kid class and the kids are rolling with the kids and the other dads are like paired off and i was like this is better than going to the gym you know I'm like, yeah there's probably a little all- camaraderie aspect to that too right like oh yeah that, that's uh that's been great uh i mean the that's the whole jiu-jitsu community is a whole another very familiar or with the hockey community in regards to respect and extending uh, out for each other when each other are in need. But I mean, you get all walks of life in there. And when you don't understand at first, you, you're like, I'm six, four, like two twenty. So if I'm going against a guy that's like five, six, but has been training for even two years, he, he's going to put me in pretzels every time. <laughs> Because I don't know, but it's more than, you know, it's using your leverage and angles to ultimately break you down and choke you out or you break one of your arms or legs. So, <laughs> That's awesome, though. Yeah, I ended up staying with it. My boys ended up kind of bailing on it, but I, I kind of stayed with it. Um, was actually, uh, before this three ice thing, I was signed up to do a competition, which I'll, I'll pick up again. I'll, I'll try to do that again. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's, it's some humble pie, and uh, there's no ego on the mat. So you, it's it's uh, it's a great spot if you're looking to uh, train, and you can actually train safe. Where I've had some previous injuries, and if I just feel awkward, or the guys wherever on my body, I just say tap. You know, I'm not there to like be a hero. Yeah. If I tap twenty times, uh, I, don't, I don't care. I just want to make it out alive. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, it uh, has made an impact on my life for sure. And hopefully to do it, I'll be able to do it for a long time. I love that. Yeah. I respect, I respect the shit out of that. I even, uh, I picked up boxing a couple of years ago and even that it's just like, it, it, it straight slice a humble pie. You never think about how tough it is. Cause I mean, it's always just been hockey conditioning, hockey conditioning, but like something like that is uh, yeah, it's a whole different ball game, but uh, kind of the final question for me, uh, this is another one of armies, uh, I guess, suggestions. I had a, uh, I honestly was going to ask this too, but army reinforced it. Um, tattoos. Um, I have two tattoos that mean the absolute world to me. Um, I got 16 blackbirds on my uh, left shoulder, right under my collarbone here. Um, I got a quote on my forearm from uh, our coach that passed away. And I think it's just something that, you know, it's obviously different for everybody, especially with the tattoo game. But for me, it's a case of, I can feel grounded knowing that, you know, I have my tattoos that mean the absolute world to me. Um, what is it with you? Is it a case of you just love getting inked? Because now, I mean, I'm hooked as well. I'm addicted. Um, and I, I love the tattoo game on yourself. So uh, explain to us maybe a little bit about your significance in the tattoo game as well. Yeah, I think um, I was always intrigued. Um, as a, even like in high school, I was more like an, an artsy guy uh, into like graphic design and art class and stuff in high school. Um, so I was always drawing, even I would, I drew, I actually just brought a notebook to all my classes and drew <laughs> in all my, all, all my classes, but, uh, my dad was not fond of tattoos. <laughs> so, uh, I had to wait till I was 18th, 18th birthday. I was in Omaha, Nebraska, and I got, uh, our family crest on our back, which is kind of a line, like our, you know, our, our shield. Um, and I thought, I'm like, you can't get mad if I'm getting the family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so that's where it started. And uh, like yourself, I mean, everyone means something to me. And um, that's how they kind of have grown from there. Um, ideally, I did save space underneath my arm here. Maybe one of the avalanche guys. I was going to get the Stanley Cup and then you could always like, open it. <laughs> <laughs> I, never, I never got there as a player maybe in management one day or something I'll, I'll have space but i always thought that would be a cool uh stanley cup tattoo that's there awesome i love it i gotta i'm going right after this my like so i'm having my wedding celebration july 14th so my my best man is my cousin and yeah. just like because of our relationship we're pretty much like like brothers but we're going 
to get tattoos. Remember, you've seen Dude, Where's My Car? Yeah. Like, you know, the dude in the suite scene yeah. when he's like, dude, what's my, we're going to get him like on our thigh or something like <laughs> high up so no one can see him, but it's just going to be like our little kind of like band of brothers type thing. We're not going to get him across our back. <laughs> yeah. We thought that was pretty funny. We were like, dude, we should get dude sweet tattooed on to us. <laughs> Bunch of meatheads. Whatever thing, right? I think that's the cool thing, uh, especially put in ink, you put it in writing, you know, there's, uh, it means something so i think that's that's cool yeah well yeah. bugsy i uh i think we could uh probably chat for another hour i mean i uh everybody talks about how much they like you army has nothing but fond things to say about you and i already like you um so we'll have to uh we'll have to even coordinate maybe an in-person when we do uh when i come down to pittsburgh but uh yeah i mean i respect what you're doing i respect you know the fact that you're okay with being vulnerable. Um, I respect how much you're a family man. Um, I just, yeah, I just can't thank you enough for coming on and, and sharing a little bit about what you're doing post-career because it, it is exciting to see what you're doing. Uh, I can imagine on your end as well, it's probably gives you a little bit more of that boost as well. And so um, it's exciting. And I'm glad we got to chat about that, but uh, Riles, I'll let you uh, finish up. No, Ty, you hit it on the head. Thanks for coming on. Good luck with the foundation stuff. That's, that's awesome. And uh yeah, just everything we hit on was was super meaningful, even for me, just to turn the light on a bit, uh, how I approach hockey, because sometimes it can be a grind. So for anyone listening, just keep plugging away. And thanks for coming on. Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. I think um, you guys got uh, Speak Your Minds, a great name for the podcast. And I think anytime you're shining light on people's experiences and uh, that really helps I think relate um, to other people that might feel like they're alone or uh, anything. So the more we can uh, spread the love, the more people we can help. And as we know, the hockey community is uh, strong. So we just need to kind of put a, a bigger spotlight on it. So appreciate your time. 100%. Appreciate you, Bugsy. Take care and we'll chat soon. All right, guys. Take it easy.